Okay, Grant, you got the zoomed in version here of me. I think right. you guys can see my screens. All right, up close and personal. Good, <laughs> good stuff. Well, um, well, thank you. So I think you can see my my screen. You'd think after a year and a half of COVID and uh, doing video calls and that sort of thing that I'd be able to get this uh, working, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we will uh, give it a shot here. Uh, let me just try one more thing. Boy, that is really zoomed in. Uh, that's good though. Okay, um, so thank you. This is my first time getting a chance to present to the HERI group and I had a lot of fun uh, putting together this presentation. So thank you, Grant, Pam, and, and uh, the team for inviting me to participate uh, this year. Uh, so for my presentation, I titled it At the Edges. And what I'm gonna do is walk through a review of what channels matter today and then what's emerging on the horizon and you know what's coming towards us that might not necessarily be, be here yet in home improvement, but there's underlying forces that are gonna drive these channels at the edge to become bigger. And, and what do organizations need to do to be successful? And I really like Doug's presentation that he just did and, and some of what our, I'll share will build on that. So, so hopefully you know, what I present will spark a degree of creativity in you all you know, and certainly build an awareness of how areas outside of our home, home improvement category are evolving. Uh, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with Stratably, I founded the subscription research company to help retail professionals better understand what's changing in digital commerce, which is such an enormous challenge, you know, just considering how fast the industry is moving. Uh, my research covers a range of different topics, everything from Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, uh, retail media networks, supply chains, social commerce, and even how teams and organizations are evolving to take advantage of digital commerce. And the research is meant for senior executives, VPs of e-commerce, those in sales and marketing within digital channels, and all the people that support those roles. And it's really designed to keep you on the leading edge of what's changing at your big accounts while also helping you identify what's coming next. So if you're interested in learning more, um, I've got a couple coupon codes there. You can try out the service uh, risk-free. Okay, so I'm gonna step through over the next 30 minutes or so, um, a, a few different topics. So I'm gonna start off by sharing some of our proprietary consumer data that we just got back this past week. And then I'll review some omni-channel performance and themes impacting all of us in the near term. Um, that's gonna build into a framework of, you know, how I think about what it takes to win today. And then we'll use that framework to help think about how it needs to evolve in order to maximize the opportunity with emerging channels, which is that uh, last section. So my hope is we get to the end of the presentation, you found one or two new ideas or data points immediately applicable to your business, along with identifying some new areas to do further research into, because it really you know, sparks your curiosity and creativity about how your company's strategy can evolve over the next couple of years. So let's just get grounded in where the consumer's at today with COVID and with their home spending plans. You can see that uh, many consumers are still indicating COVID's leading to continued risk averse behavior. We measured their responses over a range of different types of situations with events being the biggest casualty. You know, think of movies, concerts, community gatherings, things like that. Uh, interestingly, visiting stores is the least likely activity to be impacted. So essentially that's tied with going back to the workplace. You know, I think that that data points uh, particularly interesting because we've seen this robust return to stores, but at the same time, digital penetration has remained quite resilient meaning they're spending more in both channels at, at this point. And so you've got this risk averse behavior. People are spending more time at home. You know, many of you on the call today are working from home still. You know, several of the presenters are still at home. You know, you're spending much more time today in your residence than you did before the pandemic. And because of that, and because the economy is so strong, you know, we're seeing resilient demand in the home improvement category. Even, you know, as strong as last year was, a net 8% of consumers plan to spend more on their home over the next year uh, compared to the prior year. You've also got 53% planning to do major or minor home projects in the next six months, and uh, almost half anticipating buying home decor and furniture items. So, you know, that's the consumer. I think that section, while brief, it should just kind of set the stage. You should be feeling fairly confident, at least in the near-term outlook, around spend in the category. And so, how are the big retailers that you do business with, you know, thinking about uh, digital? This is data from my friends at uh, Stackline. Stackline can provide very granular insights all the way down to the product level or all the way up to the category level. And you can see that their data suggests digital growth in the category. When you combine Amazon, Walmart, Target, and Home Depot, 
is estimated at trending at 45% year over year through August. That's roughly the same uh, 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 level uh, where we were at last year during this time period and 12 to 13 points ahead of the pre-pandemic trend. Now, it's going to vary by category, okay? 53% of categories that they measure are accelerating their growth this year, um, while 47% are seeing decelerating growth. And then you can see the fastest growers this year include things like portable power, outdoor products, uh, different tools, and, and, and so on. So Home Depot, and, and many of you are doing business with Home Depot, um, it's seen de decelerating digital growth the last couple of quarters, primarily driven by difficult comps, um, but also by the consumer venturing back into stores to some degree and more of its business shifting to the pro. Its investment focus, uh, digitally speaking, is very heavily centered around supply chain capabilities, including speeding up its delivery time to same day next day, and also moving more inventory out of stores to regional centers that can then deliver uh, to the home has a big effort underway around personalization, particularly with the pro. Uh, Craig Manier talked about an example of, you know, if you or I were searching for flyers, it's gonna return a bunch of uh, different options, but they're getting to a point where they know an electrician is searching for that, and they're gonna give them a very personalized set of, of search results. Lowe's uh, saw similar digital growth trends during the pandemic, and, and like Depot has seen those rates come down for the same reasons. Uh, now, uh, this isn't to knock Lowe's in any ways, but, but but most brand leaders I talk to suggest that it's you know, a couple of years behind Home Depot when it comes to digital capabilities and the ease of managing their digital business. And, and you hear that come through to some degree when Lowe's you know, talks about things like focusing on upgrading the basics of its website, things like product detail page content and the like, you know, just very fundamental type, type things that go along with the digital business. Um, it too has a large supply chain investment going on to get to a market-based delivery model that essentially enables shipments to the home without any involvement of stores. It's a similar concept as Depot and actually very similar to some of the initiatives that Target and Walmart are doing as well. Um, Lowe's also calls out some different tests it's doing like virtual kitchen design, visual search inside of stores. You know, those aren't big needle movers necessarily, but the company's trying different things. They're experimenting, uh, which I think is a, is a positive. So this analysis is interesting. It looks at the, the frequency at which these different retailers are talking about digital commerce to their investors. And there's a substantial uh, step up over the last few years with the exception of Lowe's. And you know, what I find interesting with that is you know, five years ago, Lowe's was certainly talking the right game, but it wasn't necessarily investing in the right way. Home Depot was sort of the opposite. It was sort of quietly building up really strong uh, digital capabilities. So three takeaways, I think, from this analysis. You know, first, I think, you have to ask yourselves, is your organization keeping pace with this? Are you all making e-commerce more of a focus inside your firms? Um, secondly, as an organization, you can't just talk a big game. You need to back it up with actual investment. And third, when you expand the scope to all the retailers shown here, you know, think of, think of this kind of like how digital mix penetration has grown. It's just another signal of how important e-commerce has become um, for, your, for your big customers and how much of a focus it is um, at, at all of these major retailers, not just home improvement, but really, you know, as you look across the board. Okay, so if digital is important, you know, how do we win, win online? Everyone wants to talk about, you know, quote unquote, winning online. And, you know, frankly, how to do it is, is mostly known. I think the rubber meets the road on execution. So I'm gonna share uh, with you some ideas on capabilities needed today, and then how companies make that happen. And then in the next section, we'll talk about new channels, new capabilities that are needed and surface some of the yet to be answered questions out there. So today, you know, these are mostly the accounts that matter in the US when we're talking about home, the home improvement consumer. You've got um, Amazon and Home Depot being the most important drivers to sales online. Amazon's probably, you know, more important of the two just considering how much product research is done there. But really, you know, both are very relevant, of course, and there's not, you know, much value in arguing over which one is more important than the other. They're, they're just both important. Um, uh, Lowe's, uh, Walmart, Wayfair, of course, is quite large depending on what category you're in. And then you've got other customers that are, um, you know, bigger growth drivers in brick and mortar than they are online right now. Think of Tractor Supply, Menards, independent hardware channels, that sort of thing. Now, what's not shown on this chart is direct to consumer, which is usually pretty small for most home improvement brands right now, but it's an area that I'll talk a, a little bit more about. Um, here in some a few slides, it, it's just it's it's almost impossible essentially to get an accurate read on D2C traffic. Um, so it's not in this chart. 
Um, but what, what this chart does illustrate is the number of site visits over the past month. You know, obviously Amazon's massive, that three, that's 3.3 billion um, unique site visits. It, it, now, it's not directly comparable to Home Depot and Loza, right? Just given its assortment is much broader, but nonetheless, you see its relative cloud. And I think you also see the importance here of, of really Depot and Lowe's in this category versus some of its closer rivals online. So to capture much of the market today, you know, if you focused on Amazon, Depot, Lowe's, and, and, and maybe Wayfair, maybe Walmart for some of you, you know, you're gonna get to, to 80, 85, 90% of, of the consumer market. Okay, so, so how can you be successful in those channels today? The good news is you can pretty much boil down what you need to do on any .com existing today. And, and that's what I list here. So you could do this on Amazon, you can do this on Depot, you can do it on Lowe's, et cetera. And all of this stuff is pretty straightforward, but sometimes we, I think, lose sight of it. You know, maybe it's because the retail partner sort of pushes you in ways that don't make sense. For instance, if they want you to list all of your assortment, even though it's not, not all of it's profitable, or you know, maybe your organization just really isn't used to leveraging software tools in the way in which it's possible to do online. You know, but I think about this list and I think, okay, great. Like what, what people and tools do I need to do this? And, and how is this gonna change over time? So I'll talk about reporting structures, some roles, and, and then technology at the end here. You know, reporting structures are gonna vary by company, but most, more often than not, uh, um, the e-commerce team is going to report up through the sales organization, and maybe there's an e-commerce center of excellence that does uh, shared services like content management, uh, analytics, supply chain operations, things of that nature. So, so reporting up through sales, you know, maybe some shared uh, support services, that's kind of, the most common reporting structure uh, in, uh, for, um, in my research. Uh, from a people perspective, it all starts with a really strong VP of e-commerce, someone that's you know, been around the block in this world, they can really unlock tremendous potential online. Um, the problem is right now, for those of you looking for that person, you know, if you're kind of newer to e-commerce and COVID sort of woke you up, well, these people know they're in demand. And so they're looking for a lot of money, they're looking for a lot of great benefits, freedom, you know, everything else. So you're gonna have to pay up to get a great leader of e-commerce. Um, and if you have a great VP of e-commerce, you should know that they're probably getting calls by recruiters uh, every week. So you wanna keep them happy, you wanna keep them engaged, um, you wanna keep them uh, motivated. Now, Amazon team, you know, typically a specific team on that account at, at, at this point. I was talking to a pretty big brand um, the other day, they're doing tens of millions, almost $100 million on Amazon. And up until the pandemic, it was a one man sh uh, show. Um, and and um, about midway through the pandemic, that's now changed. So they started to add people. So in this instance, they now have five people working specifically on that account. So going from one uh, to five, it's the most complex, it has the most levers to pull. Um, it just requires the most resources, period. And, um, and interestingly, you know, I've talked with a lot of home improvement brands in the month uh, leading up to this presentation. You know, just to give you an idea, one of the roles that's being added to Amazon I thought was interesting is around forecasting. This has become very, very challenging. And leaving forecasting demand on Amazon up to the sales force person is just not getting the same level of attention it needs. So I've just talked to so many brands and this just kept coming up unprompted. I was sort of shocked. So I wanted to share that, you know, if, if you're having trouble uh, with, um, with demand planning on Amazon, you're not alone. A, a lot of companies are hiring more for that role. The other big change over the last year has been added support for the dot-coms of the Omni customers. Think of adding someone uh, to, to uh, help uh, run depot.com or lowes.com if you're a brand. Look, it's a 50-50 call on whether that person lives on the depot team versus the e-commerce team. It doesn't, I don't think it really matters. It's gonna be sort of, unique to the organization and, and how the organization functions. But what's key is the health of communication in the organization. Whatever team that resource reports to, uh, they have to be communicating with the other team. Um, so that's really the key more so than the reporting structure. Um, and if you don't have that resource, you, you, you likely uh, need it. There's a lot of opportunity uh, if you can bring someone like that onto the team. Um, uh, more and more companies are also getting an internal person to help with Omnichannel. So Depot's brand advocate resource, you know, that's a big one that many have found helpful. Amazon has a similar program, um, the SAS program. That one's more mixed. You know, it's sort of, I would describe it as 60, 70% of brands indicate the SAS program's worth it on Amazon, but boy, is it expensive. So, you know, that's a, that's a tough investment call to make. Um, but if you really need someone on the inside to help with operational things on Amazon, then, then that can be a good um, option. 
So you've got buy-in, you've got you know a decent reporting structure, you've got people. Um, the other component that we can't pass over are the digital shelf tools and advertising tools or partners. So I just, at this point, you can't effectively compete without an investment in these software tools. You've got, you know, you've got to have a sense of your position in the market online. You have to know who your competitors are, you know, which are often different than in-store. You have to know how you're showing up online. And the best way to do this is to employ software. And, and fortunately, you know, versus, you know, three years ago, five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, this area has really, really developed. Uh, over the last couple of years. So it's a possibility now more than it ever was before. On the advertising side, when it comes to Amazon, um, it's getting very, very complex. And so essentially you either have to get an advanced software tool that lets you do it yourself or pay a partner uh, that has the expertise. So, okay, so we understand the accounts that matter today. We know what's required for each and we know what type of people and tools are needed to do that. Again, this is not to minimize how hard it is to make this happen in reality, but it is meant to help uh, simplify it so that we don't get too mired in perceived complexity, okay? So, and we can then build on this foundation for what's coming. So we're gonna come back to this framework in a little bit. Um, now, if the world had you know, stopped spinning, right? We could have stopped there. We could continue to operate under that framework. Everything would be solved, presentation would be over. But you know, this is this is digital commerce. You know, this continues to change every week, essentially. Um, and so we as businesses have to continue to evolve in order to stay relevant. So I'm gonna talk about three things that while early on, I think are going to be very relevant in the not too distant future uh, for an increasing number of categories, including home improvement. So I'm gonna talk about omni enablers, social commerce, and then we'll really sort of expand our minds around what some of our youngest consumers are, are doing online today. So let's start with what I call Omni enablers. We have Instacart, Ship, Rody at Home Depot, which UPS is acquiring, but we also now have Uber and DoorDash, which is pretty incredible when you think of it. You know, no one was really expecting Uber to become a relevant part of, of retail. It just wasn't. It wasn't focused on it. But what's happening is the power of technology-driven multi-sided marketplaces is meeting that intense need by omni-channel retailers to deliver store items very quickly uh, to the consumer in an economical way. That intense delivery need is because speed was and is so important. So this is like a little history of how speed is changing. Okay, Amazon has certainly led the way, you know, in terms of setting the standard for delivery speed. You know, two-day delivery, no doubt, that became table stakes for essentially you know, everyone. Uh, but when it first got started, it was revolutionary. You know, then we moved to one day. Amazon again led the way uh, beginning in, in um, 2019. It's kind of struggled to do this nationwide because of the surge in spending that was, that um, COVID drove, but it's investing billions this year into its sort centers and FCs, and it's getting closer each quarter. It's not just Amazon though. Home Depot too talked about some of its supply chain investments, which all are, are all about getting their products, including big and bulky, to 90% of the US either same day or next day delivery. And part of that's you know, trying to move away a little bit from a store-based fulfillment, fulfillment model to a regional sort center model to help relieve some of the bottlenecks that, are, that um, stores are experiencing with digital ordering. And it can also help improve inventory accuracy. Uh, Lowe's is doing a similar model, although it's uh, a bit further behind the depot. Um, you know, if you're a brand selling into those, you know, that, that may mean, depending on your category, that you're gonna be shipping more items to the regional centers and sending less in, in, into the stores. So that's a bit of a change. Um, but I think what's more important is like, what's leading, what's leading edge when it comes to, to, to shipping speed? Um, for that, you, got, you have to look at grocery and convenience channels to see where it's going. We're talking sub 30 minutes, sub 20 minutes, down to 15 minutes or less. If you want to experience this, and I encourage you to do it because I think it really kind of opens your eyes to like how revolutionary this is, Order from GoPuff, order from Dashmark. If you're in New York, order from Gorillas. Now, there's limitations, right, to this model. They can only carry 4,000 items. It's all small food and CPG products. But here's what's important and why I encourage you to try it is that these services, they have the potential to set new consumer expectations. And you better believe that Amazon's looking very closely at these other services and identifying who they can acquire and or copy you know, so that they don't suddenly move from industry bellwether and standard setter to industry laggard. So there's this inexorable push towards instant retail. And so you have to be, whether you're a brand or a retailer, you have to be targeting 
same day delivery as table stakes in 2022 and 2023. And you wanna find ways to get it down even lower. And for many uh, retailers, that means working with Instacart or some of the others. So how do we think about these Omni enablers? They essentially sit between the consumer and the retailer and they allow the brand to plug into their platform very quickly, essentially overnight. The benefit to the retailer is the pick pack delivery capability they enable, plus they have their own source of, of traffic, which helps with customer acquisition. The problem, of course, though, is that they're now the ones forming, the Omni enablers are the ones forming that direct relationship with the consumer. Um, the retailers aren't stupid. You know, they see this happen, you know, we see this happening right now in grocery, but they don't have great alternatives. So they know it's risky, they know it's problematic to work with them longer term, but they, they keep working with them because the consumer's forcing them essentially uh, to be able to, 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 to uh, deliver quickly. Now, as a home improvement brand, you know, we can learn from the, our food and beverage peers on what these Omni enablers mean. Um, essentially, they've become an important visibility layer. So what do I mean by visibility layer? Remember when I talked about uh, the importance of product content and paid search earlier. So that's what these visibility layers require. They represent a new digital shelf that you need to show up on. In grocery, that's primarily meant taking your learnings from Amazon advertising and applying the same tools, partners, and internal people to setting up a very robust paid search ad strategy on the platform. So the same person internally doing Amazon advertising is gonna be the same one managing these Omni Enabler accounts because they're essentially just ad platforms from the brand perspective. Now, perhaps more interesting is like, what about funding? You know, you've already got full retail programs built with your retailers. They don't wanna give up any money to this intermediary. Well, that's a question that really has not been solved for the long term. Uh, however, what your peers have done is find in the short term, incremental funding, typically sourced from corporate marketing budgets to support these intermediaries. So right now it's just mostly incremental funds. Longer term, it's likely that some of this money is gonna shift out of retail programs or, or maybe other marketing areas like linear TV and print that have been seeding share uh, for years. So as more Omni enablers move into um, an expansive number of categories, you wanna assign them to your e-commerce team, find some incremental funding to support it over the short term, and think of it just as a new digital shelf that you have to be visible on. Again, early, very early here in home improvement, but these Omni enablers are expanding aggressively. They can't afford to just stick in grocery. And I'd be willing to bet within the next 18 months or so, you're gonna see them become much more important to the category. And since the tech platform just mostly plugs into the retailer, they can become relevant almost overnight. You know, one press release and they're suddenly relevant uh, for the category. So an important concept um, that's emerging. Okay, let's talk about social commerce, which has historically, I would say, not achieved its full potential as a real sales channel, but that is potentially changing. I'm gonna talk about three things within it. Um, the implications as a result of privacy changes, uh, user-generated content, and then, and then live streaming. And when I say um, potential, you know, I'm really talking about the massive reach these platforms have. Um, so this image I show here is of, of uh, TikTok, you know, the top two hashtags circle relate to DIY. They have 1.4 billion and 10.9 billion uh, views. I mean, that's just incredible, incredible reach. And TikTok's highly relevant uh, for your category, almost like what Doug was saying with beauty. You know, tic, uh, beauty's huge on TikTok. DIY home improvement can be huge on, on TikTok as well, and, and already is. Okay, so the reason why I'm suggesting, you know, much greater potential for social commerce to develop over the coming years is because of what Apple and Google are doing around privacy, mostly at the expense of Facebook and much of the advertising industry around them. Apple and Google are looking to position privacy in a way that says first party data is okay, but third party data is problematic, especially without consumer's consent. So that means first party data, like guess who has it? Apple and Google have it. Um, also your retailers have it. That's why retail media is um, uh, uh, growing rapidly. And you might have it as well, depending on what you're doing with your own website. All of that first party data is much more valuable today than it was a year ago and certainly a couple of years ago. But what this means for social networks is a direct threat to their business because it's going to become much more difficult for them to track the effectiveness of you seeing an ad, um, targeting you, and then also ultimately whether or not you bought that product on another site. So measurement becomes very challenging. It essentially disrupts that uh, feedback loop shown on the slide. So what's a social network to do? So social networks are working aggressively to develop their own commerce abilities in order to continue to be able to illustrate the effectiveness of their ads. 
meaning Facebook needs to have its own storefront or enable the advertiser to integrate its storefront into the platform in order to keep the user within its fortress. And so for brands and retailers, you have to start becoming really smart on social platforms, not just from a brand marketing perspective, but more so from how do we leverage the platform to drive sales? You know, this is still very early in development, right? But the reason why I'm talking about it is when I discuss this with VPs of e-commerce, they have almost nothing to say in regards to what their organizations are doing from a social commerce perspective. They talk about how that team's separate, you know, they're focused on other goals and so on. And I think that's been fine historically, but it's really problematic for everyone involved. The digital teams are gonna to have to get a lot more savvy from a sales perspective, and the e-commerce teams are gonna to need to understand social a whole lot better. So if we were to get back together in you know, maybe two or three years, I'd expect that to change. I'd expect the VP of e-commerce to be able to articulate her social commerce strategy very clearly, and that sales running through or integrated through Facebook, Snap, TikTok, et cetera, to be a non-trivial number. So what do we need to do to like tap into this, whether you're a brand or a retailer? One of the uh, capabilities you need is flexing what I call your trend to action muscle. So TikTok in particular has ushered in this incredible ability to reach billion, millions, even you know, billions uh, of views, but it's also extremely ephemeral. Brands often can't capitalize on these viral trends on the platform because they don't know what they are and they don't have the people, tools, or processes to react. So I wanted to plant the seed today that the benchmark for moving from identifying what's trending on social to taking action is less than 36 hours. And a case study of this comes from Vitacoco, which uses a technology by Sightly. And Sightly surfaces broad trends it wants to align with so that it can create its own similarly relevant content and get it out there quickly. So the company did this when the hashtag nature cereal was trending back in March. And uh, when it jumped on it, its video got over 2.4 million views. That compares to the median view of its account at around 800, so 2.4 million versus 800. And interestingly, it did another post with the same hashtag a month later that only got 1,800 reviews. So if you can react in sub 36 hours, you get 2.4 million. If it takes you a month, you get 1,800. That's the fundamental difference of being at speed uh, in this type of environment. So you need the ability to quickly identify what's being posted online and respond to it in a very thoughtful way leverage it to expand its reach and incorporate it into your product detail page content, your social marketing, and even in some cases, your product, uh, uh, product development. And fortunately, there's just a lot of cool activity going on here in the technology space to help brands with this. Um, both TikTok and Snap have released tools this year to help brand advertisers understand what's trending on their platforms. Um, and then, and then uh, one of the interesting companies that I'm working with now is Viral. And it helps companies understand what's inside of user-generated videos so that they can determine who's doing the video, what products are in the video, what type of sentiments it's featuring, uh, featuring, and what's trending. And I'm just a firm believer that this is going to be a major area of innovation over the next several years, and it's going to make this 36-hour challenge uh, that much easier. Uh, one other idea on social commerce, and, and, and Doug talked a little bit about this in his session, is live streaming. Uh, live streaming is a form of social commerce because you're essentially doing a live sales experience where the host is interacting with a community of potential consumers. Now, this is a very small part of the U.S. retail environment today. I wrote about that a couple months ago, but it's massive in China, and, and it's on pace to $131 billion in sales this year. And, and because of that, Walmart, Home Depot, Amazon are all investing behind it. Venture capital is pouring money into live streaming platform. Whatnot's probably the leader in the U.S., they uh, just raised 150 million at a $1.5 billion valuation. Um, so this is an important area. I would say if you're a big brand, you've got you know, enough resources, you got some test budget, this needs to be an area for the test budget. Even if the KPIs aren't fully formed, you might not necessarily get a lot of measurable benefit up front. It's a way to participate. It's a way to start learning about social commerce. Okay, last idea for you. Um, this is around, immersive digital environments, increasingly digitalized, what some call being extremely online. Um, this is particularly relevant for younger generations that are as digitally native as it gets. And, and it can have different applications, but one of it is gaming. Ton of activity in gaming. Brands are getting more involved. But again, like gaming environments as relevant channels, like who would have thought about this stuff a few years ago? It's pretty wild, pretty strange. We're having a hard time wrapping our head around Amazon being relevant. Uh, but now we're talking about gaming. 
Um, so I think gaming is really interesting to consider, especially as you take a step back and you start thinking about what's possible and what's likely to be relevant to your youngest consumers over the next several years. So let me give you know let me give you an idea, and I share some on the slide here, but you know digital environments like Fortnite, Roblox, very relevant to Gen Z, the next wave of homeowners. You know if you're a big home improvement retailer or maybe you're a big uh, home improvement brand, lawn and garden brand, home brand, do you go out? find a great creative agency and create this whole Roblox environment that your youngest consumers are, can, can go into, manipulate their virtual homes and gardens, and maybe even buy your digital products that they're showing they have an interest in buying. If this sounds stupid, like, like welcome to how I felt doing research on this space. You know, I read, I read about this all the time. I talk to people in the space and I sort of scratch my head on some of it because it is odd and it's not immediately obvious how you leverage this in the home improvement space. But believe it or not, this is not stupid to an increasing number of consumers. And if you can figure it out, again, with creative partners, it can do so much more than the equivalent amount of money going to display ads. Okay, so let's try to tie this all together. You know, this is what I showed you in terms of winning today. If you're doing this, you're likely growing at or ahead of your categories online. And I think this will probably be enough for you to do over the next couple of years. But as we get beyond this, you know, the world keeps going here. The three new ideas I shared, Omni enablers, social commerce, being extremely online, it means we need to build on this diagram a little bit. And so that's what I've done here on this slide. I've added in new channels, new capabilities, new execution. At the top are the new channels. I think that Omni enablers are probably the nearest term uh, consideration for this category. They're very desperate for growth and they have the flexibility to enter nearly any category they want to. Social channels, more of a medium term consideration, perhaps sooner if you have a robust D2C business. But remember, the key point with social commerce, the privacy changes impacting the ad industry are what will drive them to develop commerce capabilities. On capabilities, you're building onto what you're already doing here, uh, but with an ability to more quickly identify and respond to what's trending, really maximizing that opportunity with user generated content, um, that 36 hour trend to action muscle that I talked about. Again, it's not easy to do this today. It's gonna to be helped by more startups um, uh, that are created in the coming years. And then I think more broadly, you know, embrace that test and learn mindset. Don't, ask, don't, don't say like, is live streaming relevant to us? Think about it like, how can we make live streaming work for us? I think that attitudes inside of organizations, if you can shift to more of a test and learn mindset, an open growth mindset, that's what's gonna allow you to sort of come up with creative opportunities to participate in some of these emerging areas. Finally, on execution, you know, the people and tools to make this come alive. When the, if, if and when the Omni enablers come in in a big way to home improvement, assign the Amazon team to manage it. That's what your grocery peers have done. Just think of it like a new visibility, the visibility layer that you need to optimize with product content and advertising. Um, secondly, you know, start breaking down that barrier between e-commerce and digital marketing. As commerce starts to pervade social platforms, VPs of e-commerce have to be able to articulate the strategy and sales KPIs need to be part of what the digital team is measured on. And then gaming, like I, I get it, gaming is pretty far off, but don't ignore what's happening in that channel. Gen Z is the next wave of consumers to figure it out and they're extremely online. The key is to find some good creative agencies to help you tap into this and really stand out. You know, so, so certainly, you know, a lot to take in on this slide and consider here, but you know, I feel enthused about it. I think it's all achievable because most of you already have a great foundation in place. You're doing really well on these existing channels. And now it's just all about, let's build on that foundation. Let's take advantage of what's coming. So very short presentation, that's the end of it. Covered a lot of ground. One thing I did do was I created this slide and you're gonna get a copy of the slide deck. It has some of, some of my favorite reading on the subjects that I covered today. So when you get the deck, if you wanna learn more, you can go to this slide, you can click in, uh, to these articles and, and read more about it. Um, and I'm also you know, certainly happy to connect one-on-one -on -one with, with uh, any, any of you as well uh, to talk more about these. So uh, with that, Grant, I know we were running a little over time before. I'm not sure if we have any uh, Q&A. You did or great, Ross. Um, thanks for the deep dive um, and getting into uh, to some of these more you know, digitally oriented topics. Uh, I do have a couple questions. One is on the social side. Do you have some examples within home improvements, hardware, lumber building materials? of those companies that are doing it well with social that, that, that might be good examples? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think, and I showed you those, um, those um, 
uh, stats on TikTok within home improvement. And we're talking about billions and billions of views, but when you go into those, you don't see an overwhelming presence or really much of a presence from any of the big, you know, major, major brands, which are really gonna be the ones uh, to move in first. So I think it's still very early and you don't even necessarily see it from Home Depot or Lowe's yet. And I'll contrast that with like uh, Walmart as an example. Walmart's been a relatively early mover uh, into TikTok and even within the home decor, they have a, a TikTok account called Four Walls. You know, uh, download the app, go to Four Walls, look at that content. Like it looks very different, um, mm. but it's relevant to the to to the home. So Walmart's kind of testing there. Um, home Depot and Lowe's, I haven't seen you know as as much out of. Um, Amazon's doing some work, but really they've tried to like capitalize on all the product discovery happening on TikTok by creating like uh, uh, specific storefronts within its website. Um, so I think the best example is Walmart, but even that, you know, that's kind of, that, that's home and home decor, but they're even doing other categories as well, like like beauty and, and um, food as well. Okay. Um, another question for you as well. Um, I know we've got, got uh, probably a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Um, I know for a fact we've got some manufacturers um, that are attending right now that would be more on the commodity oriented side of the industry. So think fasteners, air filters, yeah. screws, nuts, bolts. And then we've got some folks that are on you know, the fashion plumbing side. Um, so does, does this strategy, do these approaches exclude those that maybe are more price sensitive, commodity oriented versus lifestyle and fashion? I think only, it, it's only uh, uh, limited by our creativity. So like, if you were to ask me like, what does great content look like on social for fasteners? I would say I'd have to spend more time thinking about that, but I'm not in the category, right? And I'm not the creative agencies working with them. So, um, so I think it's probably easier in a, in a fashion plumbing type category, you know, than it is fasteners. But what I would say is that, you know, you have some marketing effort around your products, you know, what makes it compelling. And if you, you know, not to, not to kind of ring a siren here, but if you can't figure out what makes it compelling and you can't come up with anything creative around it, then you are a commodity and, and it's a problem for you. And it's gonna be hard to stay relevant over long term. So if I were in, if I were in you know, that space, um, what I would do is spend time on these social platforms. I would mm -hmm. see what's out there. Is there anything else, you know, in, is anyone else in our categories, anyone in adjacent categories, what are they doing that's working and use that as a case study and try to apply it. Again, all within, you know, recognizing we don't have unlimited resources, but that's how I would sort of approach that, you know, approach that challenge. That's great. Appreciate it, Russ. Um, Matt, I'll turn it to you to see if there's um, maybe one question before we take a, a short break here. Yeah, sure. Um, so one of them that, that's a little bit different out here is can you expand on some ways for the use of gaming for advertising? That's not something that we've talked about in depth uh, too much so far. Yeah, so um, so that has a lot of dimensions to it. So one dimension is you can tap into the gaming world, the gaming community, right? And Amazon's one of the best ways to do that. So Amazon owns Twitch, which is one of the largest game streaming platforms in the world. And that's really Amazon's sort of like answer to social commerce uh, in, in, in a respect. So that's one way to tap into gaming is to advertise um, um, uh, uh, to to that audience of gamers and gaming, you should probably do some study, some additional research um, around demographics of gaming. I think we tend to think like gaming, it's all like young people, but actually gaming really spans across a range of, of demographics. Um, um, secondly is, and this is sort of a nascent area, um, but is in-game advertising is starting to develop uh, as well. And so you can buy uh, like billboards inside of games and you know that sort of thing. So that's another way uh, to approach it. And then the third way is kind of the, the example I shared with you, which is more of like an immersive thing where brands will you know build kind of their own world. I haven't seen this happen in home improvement per se, but I did show you like a home design example um, that wasn't branded, but you know it's a home, it's a garden. Like you know people are interacting with that environment. Um, you do see more of that in like fashion and apparel. Uh, where kind of high fashion brands are, are doing that today. So that's sort of the case study on that. And, and in one of the links I have, it, it talks about a little bit about you know, that. Russ, um, thanks again for the time today. Um, the insights and information, very, very useful um, as we continue to discussing uh, channel, which is our main topic today. So thank you again, Russ, appreciate it. 
Yeah, thank you, Grant, and uh, good luck, and, and I hope uh, everyone's had a great uh, summit. So thank you very much for having me.